Good morning. Good morning. This is Russ and Kitty Walden with Father's Heart Ministry. Welcome to the Morning Light Bible Study. Today, alert from calendar. <laughs> today, Joshua I, Chris Mauliagbe's. Pardon the Google Calendar. It's, pardon our calendar. It's quite efficient, <laughs> as you can tell. Today we are. Oh my. We are experiencing technical difficulties. Thank you, God. <coughs> We're in the Exodus chapter 19. And, Kitty, why don't you just go ahead and start reading uh, down through uh, verse 5. Chapter 19 of Exodus. In the third month, when the children of Israel were gone forth out of the land of Egypt, the same day they came into the wilderness of Sinai, where they were departed from Ref... Rephidim. Yeah, that place, Rephidim. And were come to the desert of Sinai, and had pitched in the wilderness. And there Israel camped before the mount, and Moses went up unto God, and the Lord called unto him out of the mountain, saying, Thus shalt thou say to the house of Jacob, and tell the children of Israel, Ye have seen what I did unto the Egyptians, and how I bare you on eagles' wings, and brought you unto myself. Now therefore, if you will obey my voice, indeed, and keep my covenant, then ye shall be a peculiar treasure unto me, above all people, for all the earth is mine. So God compares bringing the Moses and the children of Israel out of Egypt to an eagle carrying their young on their wings. Now, I have a question. Do eagles really carry their young on their wings? If you study this and do an inquiry into ornithology, which is a study of birds, most people will tell you they, in fact, do not do that. But one of the things, and this is where you get into uh, controversy over things pertaining to religion, uh, usually you will find the rejection of that thought of an eagle carrying her young on her wings uh, has a little attitude behind it. It's as though, you know, the, 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 there's an, an, an anti-God, anti-spiritual, anti-Bible uh, prejudice and, and it's kind of a dismissive answer when you, when you study this out. So I want to take some time and I did some research, quoting from a blog, Judaism and the Animal Kingdom. And listen to what it says and what it means. What does it mean that an eagle carries her young on her wings? And I'm quoting, reports do exist of eagles carrying their young on their backs. Mm -hmm. Now, that's, this is in the middle of a particular post where it talks about how, for the most part, Almost every uh, authority on ornithology will say that absolutely does not happen. But let's listen to what they say. Many ornithologists have thought that the Bible picture of an eagle carrying her young was merely figurative. But in recent years, reliable observers have actually seen a parent bird let its young rest for a moment on its feathered back especially when there was no roosting place inside. When an eagle nests on a ledge of a sheer wall canyon many feet above the earth with no tree or rock, uh, the quick movement of a mother bird to offer her own back to a frightened fledgling may be the only way to let it live. Now this is an uh, ornithologist by the name of Holmgren. Uh, now here's another report. Uh, this, is a, this is a field report of ob observing golden eagles. Uh, our guide was one of a small company. Uh, he's describing something that happened out in the field. Our guide was one of a small company who had seen the golden eagle teaching the young how to fly. He could support the belief that the parent birds after urging and sometimes shoving the youngster into the air <coughs> excuse me, will swoop underneath and rest the struggler for a moment on their wings and back. Our guide, when questioned, said that every phrase of verse uh, of Deuteronomy, uh, where it mentions it and also here in uh, Exodus, uh, which was new to him, was accurate. 
He had seen it all, except that he hadn't seen the stirring up of the nest, which is also spoken of. Now, here's another report concerning golden eagles uh, that comes from a man by the name of Arthur Bent at, at one time, uh, one of America's greatest ornithologists. And he's quoting the authority of another doctor, uh, another scientist by the name of Miller. And then here is a field report of, of observing a golden eagle. The mother started from the nest in the crags, and roughly handling the youngster, she would allow him to drop, I should say, about 90 feet. Thanks. Can you imagine dropping your baby? Mm-mm. <laughs> Hello. 90 feet. And then she would swoop down under him, wings spread, and he would alight on her back. She would then soar to the top of the range with him and repeat the process. Once, perhaps, she waited 15 minutes between flights in this process. I should say the farthest she let him fall was 150 feet. 15 stories, by I the way. I cannot imagine. <laughs> we watched him spellbound for over an hour. Now, this is uh, this ornithologist Arthur Bent in the Bulletin of the Smithsonian Institution in 1937. So this is something that could be independently verified. And an interesting question, an interesting controversy, because those that don't believe it uh, don't believe it with a vengeance in order to scoff at what the scriptures uh, say. And there were many beliefs in Bible times. For instance, uh, Josephus, who is probably the most authoritative ancient historian of uh, the first and second century, the third century, uh, he wrote about... Uh, the phoenix, uh, with authority, that the phoenix was a bird that would fly back to its original nesting place and uh, would uh, uh, create somehow a fire, cast itself into the flames, and then arise renewed. Mm. And the phoenix was a, a metaphor for resurrection, not just in Christian times. Christians would use not only the ictus, the fish symbol, but they would also use the phoenix, and you'll find that in catacombs many times, but of course we know that the phoenix is a mythical bird. We know that phoenix is a city in Arizona, <laughs> Arizona. where we have some good friends. Yay. Uh, so the Lord says, I bore you up on eagle's wings, but it's not just, you know, uh, that is not just, oh, I'm comforting, protecting, and taking care of you. No, I'm bearing you up on eagle's wings for a purpose to teach you how to fly. God is the, the, the bird in flight, and he's wanting to bring us up into his environment. It's like the Lord told me one time, he said, I'm not coming down to you, you're going to have to come up here to me. <laughs> and yes, he'll come down and he'll bail us out. But he will put us in positions, it's interesting because I wrote an article years ago that I was very personally invested in, called Free Fall to the Father. <laughs> and... Uh, I'd had a vision of myself through a very painful circumstance of being in a plane and uh, the pilots uh, put it on autopilot, jettisoned all the fuel, came back and threw out all the parachutes except theirs and then bailed out themselves and then God tells me to bail out. Without a parachute. Without a parachute. <clears throat> and I did and I landed on my feet and I was okay. And I wrote this article about free fall to the Father. Amen. You can trust him. From that day till this, that was seven years ago, eight years ago, and I just now for the first time ever equated it to this verse of Scripture. That's awesome. And so the word of the Lord is, time for you to fly. (laughs) Simplify so you can fly. (laughs) Moments of exhilarating upward movement with terrifying downward plunges. (laughs) But the Lord's going to take care of you. It's fun. So... You know, if you will listen to God, <coughs> he will tell on himself because here they are at the beginning of the wilderness journey and he's giving them an idea of what that's going to be like. There were moments of great testimony, but there were also moments of fearfulness. And because they didn't understand the challenge, they complained, they murmured, and many perished unnecessarily. But the Lord never does anything, but he doesn't let you know ahead of time that's right. uh, that, you know, fasten your seatbelt, return your tray to the upright position, Uh, We're going to experience a little turbulence here. And if you read verse 5 now. I read 5. Oh, did you read 5? Okay, so if you'll obey my voice, notice the if. 
if you obey my voice and keep my covenant, then you shall be a peculiar treasure to me above all people. Um, in the prophetic, now always remember, Moses is a prophet. If you go from Genesis to Revelation, you will find prophetic leadership more than you will find pastors, more than you will find apostles, more than you will find teachers, evangelists, or any other ministry throughout the old, under the Old Covenant economy, under the New Testament economy of God, uh, throughout uh, the, the, century, the first century of the early church. Prophetic ministry is continually... God described Jesus to Moses by saying, I'm going to raise up a prophet like unto you. Now, we don't say that by exclusion because we know Ephesians 4, 11, and 12 says there are five ministries. We call that the five-fold ministry. But yet, uh, if our religious culture, if Christian culture reflected the homogenous culture of the Old and New Testaments, our leaders, the most prominent leader that you would see would be the ministry of a prophet. Something, something to think about in, in a day that the prophetic is, is uh, for the most part, rejected. Uh, even where it's received, it's received with caveats. <laughs> it's received with, you know, uh, with, with this disclaimer. And uh, uh, in the prophetic, it, it notice it says, if you will hear my voice. He didn't say, if you'll read my word. They had scripture at that time. And keep my covenant. If you will hear, obey my voice and keep my covenant. In the prophetic, <clears throat> people expect to hear what God is saying about them. And just as importantly, they want to know what's God going to do about what's going on in their lives. What we often fail to understand is the if. Uh, all prophecy, listen to me, all prophecy is provisional and conditional. All prophecy is provisional and conditional. And as such, the pr prophecy is as much about God giving them an assignment as it is anything else. Isaiah 119 puts it real simply. If you're willing in obedience, You'll eat the good of the land. Obedient to what? If you're being obedient to the word of God, of course we don't want to violate the word of God. But it's like I give you a set of rules and, and then you get to establish whether or not you're obedient to that. But it's different when you're, you're receiving the direct voice of God. It's like when I was in the military, I had standing orders. Get up in the morning and come to work. I, I didn't have to have my sergeant when I was in the military to tell me to come to work the next morning. And and if I was five minutes late, I wasn't punished, you know, because I obeyed the spirit of that expectation. Get up and come to work. I had rules uh, that, that was laid out for me in the job that I had in the Air Force. But then there were times that my sergeant would look at me and he'd say, I'm giving you a direct order. And every time he did that, I'd get, it's like, i get goosebumps. It's like, okay. Now I know I have to absolutely obey. And that's the difference between the Logos of the Scriptures and the Rhema of the prophetic word. And again, remember that the thing about the prophetic in the New Testament is not just to bring you the voice of God, but to activate the voice of God in your own heart and life. Mm -hmm. Your primary accountability is to the voice of God in your own life. But the prophetic is there to keep that in the forefront and to help you hear from God for yourself. So it's if you hear my voice. It's not about rule keeping. If you hear my voice, he didn't say if you keep the rules. And he's about to give them a bunch of rules. See, he gave them a bunch of rules that they found repugnant. Maybe he did that because, okay, do you want the rules or do you want the voice? You have a choice. I'd rather have the voice of God. I'd rather have intimacy with the mouth that spoke uh, the rules. Mm -hmm. If you'll hear my voice, this is not about keeping rules. It implies intimate knowledge of the personal voice of God. Number one, through the prophetic. Number two, through hearing the voice of God for yourself. Proverbs 1.8 says, My son, remember where in Hebrews it says that the church is your mother? We're come to the new Jerusalem, the church of the living God, the mother of us all. So Paul in 
the book of Hebrews compares the church as being our mother. Proverbs 1.8 says, My son, hear the instruction of your father. In other words, it's like, I'm talking to you, listen to me. I'm going to give you instruction. And forsake not the law of your mother. So, your dad says, I want you to get out of bed, go out to that garage, get the gas can and go buy some gas for the mower and get that grass cut today. And your mom is laying down the rules. Make sure you have a clean pair of underwear on when you do that because you might get an accident on the way and you want to be, if you have to go to the ER, you want to have clean underwear on. That's mom's rule. You listen to the voice of your, the instruction of your father and the voice of your mother. Your mom lays down the rule. And it's interesting because in our culture, it's exactly the opposite. Dad lays down the rules, and you know he does, because mom says, wait till your father gets home. Yikes. <laughs> but that isn't the way, uh, that isn't familial culture. Is God intended it. God intended, you know, mom lays down the rules, and she's got to go cook, cook supper. She's got something. Dad, in our culture, he runs off to work. But in that culture, dad was intimately involved in everything. He was giving intimate, day-by-day instructions. And that's what God, God wants to do with, with you. And if you do that, he says, you're going to be peculiar. <laughs> We're, well, we qualify. A peculiar treasure to me above all people. See, it's how he sees us. But if we want to come into that, we have to cooperate. And if you read verses 6 and 7. And ye shall be unto me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. These are the words which thou shalt speak unto the children of Israel. And Moses came and called the elders of the, of the people and laid before their faces all these words which the Lord had commanded him. And notice that God is saying to Moses, ye, you, he's talking about the entire nation of Israel, you are going to be a kingdom of priests. God's intention clearly was to have a kingdom of priests and not just a special class of holy people among them as leaders. Revelation chapter 2 verse 6 says, puts it this way. Jesus is talking and he says, I hate the deeds of the Nicolaitans. And he's commending the church in Ephesus because he says, uh, I, I'm, I'm commending you because you hate the deeds of the Nicolaitans too. I hate it and you hate it and that's good. Well, who were the Nicolaitans? Whatever they were, we don't want to be like them. The word Nicolaitan is a compound word of two words that you and I are quite familiar with. Clergy, laity. Mm -hmm. The whole concept, the word clergy comes from the word kleros, that means sacred. The word laity is a Greek word that means vulgar. The unwashed masses. We see that in the, you know, people who hate religion... In the cult of celebrity, you want to talk about worship? That is tremendous. Turn on the news or turn on anything, anything you watch on television and you see those that we are the celebrities. We are in the know. We are the beautiful people. You are the unwashed masses. And so, trust me, you, you, you turn on the media today and you see that the, the deeds of the Nicolaitans, but the church, where did they learn that? They learned it. Western culture was raised up in a, in a system in the Dark Ages that clearly established we are the nobility, we are the clergy, uh, we are the, the sacred ones, you are the commoners, you are the serfs, you are a part of my fiefdom. And our whole culture is built upon that, and that is something that God hates. And he was not establishing that in Moses, that, that disparity. He wanted all God's people to be a sacred people, holy to himself. And the fundamental implications of God's hatred of the clergy laity dichotomy, that's the word for it, uh, it's. It, it, as it applies to Christian culture, the, the implications of that are staggering. Because that's the very definition of Christian culture as we know it. And just something for us to think about. But God wants us to be a kingdom of priests. And, and then verse 8. 
And all the people answered together and said, All that the Lord has spoken we will do. And Moses returned the words of the people unto the Lord. And go ahead and do verse 9, if you would. And the Lord said unto Moses, Lo, I come unto thee in a thick cloud, that the people may hear when I speak with thee, and believe thee forever. And Moses told the words of the people unto the Lord. Now notice, Moses is their prophet, and look at the response of the people to Moses. All that the Lord says, we will do. So they understood it wasn't just Moses talking, it was the Lord talking, and their attitude was not, Tell me what God's going to do for us. But, t- but, w- but they understood when, when God spoke through the prophetic, he was giving them a way to align with what God was saying in their own heart and life. All that the Lord says, we will do. They understood that God was laying before them an assignment. To exclude this from your understanding of the prophetic is to look at the pro- prophecy or personal prophecy as mere clairvoyance or as psychic reading. And we get this all the time. We see that more than we see anything else. Uh, In fact, there's a lot of teachings on the prophetic. There's a lot of people who think they have a handle on what the prophetic is and how it's supposed to work. And the way they describe it is no different than a 900 psychic line. That is not how God intended the prophetic to work. Now, notice that the Lord appeared in a cloud. It's like, you know, he appeared in a cloud. And Hold on, back up, rewind. What do you mean he appeared in a cloud? If you look that word cloud up, it will say, it's a theological term, it means a theophonic cloud. And it comes from the word theophany. It, it is a visible manifestation of God. Does he do that today? Uh I would say you would find a lot of people, even prophetic people, that would say God doesn't do that anymore. And they have a, you know, we criticize those that don't believe in the baptism and the Holy Ghost. and They have a what they call a cessationist doctrine. But I've heard a lot of uh, people who believe in speaking in tongues who will reject things like um, clouds showing up, angels showing up in meetings, uh, gold dust falling, jewels falling out of the out of the, the the air, out of thin air, and people will reject that. And Kitty's had experiences. She's had those very things happen to her. I've been... I was sitting with a minister one time, and I watched as he began to preach, the gold dust manifested more and more. It got thicker and thicker on his clothes, and if I hadn't seen it with my own eyes, you guys, it would have been hard to believe. Bob Shadows, who came out of, um, who's the lady with the glory? Ruth Ward Heflin. She had prayed for him. and So we went to this meeting, and it was an awesome experience, you guys, because um, I always saw it manifest so much on him and, and the people he prayed for. So at the end of one of his services, he says, anybody who just want more of God, come on up here. Well, I had on a black, if you can, uh, if you know the fabric, jacquard. It's like a satiny-looking uh, pants set, a pantsuit, long tunic and black slacks. And when I went up there and I had him pray for me, I just wanted more of God. Well, I was slain in the spirit. And when I woke up, somebody said, well, look at you. And I said, I know, I'm really drunk on the Holy Ghost. No, no, he said, look at you. And I looked down and I'm completely slathered in gold dust from my head down to my toes, in my hair, all over my back, all the way down me. And I... And I walked around in that hotel um, area for five or six hours, and it was still on me. And people would stop and look and just walk on that didn't understand it. But I just was so grateful to God. I said, you didn't have to do it, but thanks. That was kind of cool. So the next (laughs) time you see a manifestation like that, you can point at it and with great authority say, that is a theophonic manifestation. (laughs) (laughs) I didn't know that either. (laughs) Theologian Charles Briggs defines theophany this way. It is the means by which God discloses himself to man called a theophany. It is God taking the initiative and personally revealing himself in various forms. Fire, cloud, angel, man, and occasionally a disembodied voice. Moses heard the voice of God speaking out of the mountain. And the impact of this brings the knowledge that God is revealing himself as personally present. Now, does God still do this today? Hebrews 13.8 says Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever. That means God is God, and he can do anything he wants, anytime he wants. 
And he doesn't have to check with anybody. Yes, amen. And I got that from a very authoritative, unimpeachable uh, source. <laughs> She's sitting right next to me. <laughs> It's true. And again, God. Kitty brought the example. Ruth Ward Heflin. Mm -hmm. You study her life. We don't get her book called The Glory. And just go read testimonies of who she was and the things that God did. Uh, God has a way of getting our attention. And he still does these things today. I've experienced that cloud. I drove through a cloud. Mm -hmm. The angel of the Lord showed up. The, the one time that I had, I've seen angels in dreams. But the one time that I saw an angel, this angel appeared in a pillar of cloud. Um, and I was I was in a very distraught state. I was frustrated. I was unhappy. I was crying out to God. And I looked up in the road, and here was a pillar of cloud right in front of me in the shape of an angel. And it was about 25 feet tall. I drove right through it, and I stopped and got out of the car. In the middle of the road, I didn't care about traffic. I got out of the car, and I looked. And usually you drive through a mist. It dissipates, and it was still there, and I went and walked back right in the middle of it and lifted my hands and began to cry out to God about some yes, things in my Lord. life. Yes, Lord. And, uh, and the result of that was some really wonderful things that God hap that, that happened in my life, and one of them is sitting right here next to me. <laughs> Isn't he sweet? <laughs> Isn't he precious? <laughs> Go ahead and do verse 9 and 10. Okay, I did not, but I'll do it again. And the Lord said to Moses, Lo, I come unto thee in a thick cloud that the people may hear when I speak with thee, and believe thee forever. And Moses told the words unto the people. And the Lord said unto Moses, Go unto the people and sanctify them today and tomorrow, and let them wash their clothes. Okay. Now, God, one of the, what is God saying in telling them to wash their clothes? Does that mean uh, if they have body odor, he's not going to accept them? Uh, that if they're not wearing a nice, crisp uh, suit that's been to the dry cleaners, is it God saying go cleanliness is next to godliness? No. We wash our clothes with water. What is, and it's interesting, they wash their clothes with the water that came out of the rock. And mm -hmm. the scripture says that Jesus was that rock, and he's the living word. You know, clothes are a form of affectation. It's how we present ourselves to people. What we wear is determined by the occasion. Clothes speak of how we present ourselves to others or our outward lifestyle. How do we wash our clothes? By the Logos and the Rhema. Ephesians 5.26 talks about Jesus sanctifying us and cleansing us by the washing of water by the word. In John 15.3, he said, Now you are clean through the word which I have spoken unto you. So the permissiveness in a meeting, we need to have both the Logos and the Rhema. It's like when you wash your clothes, you need two things. You need the detergent of the Logos, but you need the living water of the Rhema. You need to have both in order to have decency and order in a meeting. 1 Corinthians 14.26 says, How is it then, brethren, when you come together? Now, does this describe church as we know it? When you come together, every one of you hath a psalm, a doctrine, a tongue, a revelation, an interpretation. Is that how it is when we go to meetings? No. Usually we go to meetings and there's only a, a select group of Kleros who are on a raised platform and the unspoken statement here is only the ones on the platform have anything of value to say. And it's not coming against church buildings or saying let's put all the uh, the chairs in a circle. We've all done all that that foolishness and that's not the point. But the point is that God wants everyone, every one of you hath a hymn, a psalm, a doctrine, a tongue, an interpretation. Let all things be done unto edifying. And if something is revealed to one that sits by, let the first hold his peace. Can you imagine getting up and say, Pastor, excuse me, and the pastor holds his peace? You're going to have the security guards escorting you out. Because they'll say, oh, that's out of order. But yet the very next verse here says, let all things be done decently and in order. There's two things that are the key to decency and order uh, whenever we gather together. One of them is let all things be done. The other one says in order. And if all things are not being done, I don't care how uh, acceptable that is, that's indecent in God's eyes because we've, we've stifled his voice through those that he chooses to speak through by limiting it to a kleros, mm -hmm. to a clergy class, to this professional class that we pay to be spiritual, we pay to worship, we pay to sing, and they're just simply leading us, and really what they're doing more than anything else is performing before us. 
And it's not indicting or impeaching any particular one, but just saying that the culture of Christianity as a religion does not reflect the, the record of the scripture because they were all supposed to wash their clothes. In other words, they were all supposed to handle the water of the word to cleanse their, their lives. So it, it wasn't just limited to some special group. Uh, and verse 11 and 12 and 13. And be ready against the third day, for the third day the Lord will come down in the sight of all the people upon Mount Sinai. And thou shalt set boundaries unto the people round about, saying, Take heed to yourselves that you go not up into the mountain, or touch the border of it. Whosoever toucheth the mount shall be surely put to death. There shall not be a hand touch it, but he shall surely be stoned or shot through, whether it be beast or man. It shall not live. When the trumpet soundeth long, they shall come up to the mount. So be ready against the third day. What's happening on the third day? Visitation. Yes. That's the difference between Old Covenant and New Covenant. The Old Covenant is about visitation. The New Covenant is about habitation. And God's bringing us to a third day habitation. If you read Hosea, and we're going to quote Hosea in just a minute, the third day is a concept throughout Scripture that denotes visitation, God setting things in order according to the power of his kingdom. Genesis 1.13, the land and the seas were divided on the third day. Genesis 22.4, Abraham found the place to sacrifice Isaac on the third day. Matthew 16.1, Jesus rose on the third day. What is the meaning for us prophetically? Remember a day with the Lord is as a thousand years and a thousand years is as a day? Mm -hmm. We are in the third day, the third millennial day from the resurrection of Jesus. Well, what's going to happen then? After two days, he will revive us. Okay, he's going to visit us in revival. But in the third day, we're going to move from revival visitation to glory habitation. In the third day, he's going to after two days, he's going to revive us. We saw the Azusa Street Revival. We saw the latter rain outpouring in 1948. And primitive New Testament Christianity was restored to Christian culture. But in the third day, he's going to raise us up uh, and we shall live in his sight. In other words, we're moving from revival visitation mm -hmm. to glory habitation. And notice that it says, and there shall not a hand touch it. What does that mean, not a hand touch it? Because this is the mount of God's habitation. Man's works have no place here. Ephesians 2, nine says, We enter into these things not of works, lest any man should boast. In 2 Samuel chapter 6, verses 6 through 7, we read about um, Yuza, when they were bringing the ark in, he reached out and put his hand on the ark of God, and he was struck dead. Because man's efforts, the hand of man does not, has no place in the habitation of God. It's we have to put our confidence in God. It's, it's, Jesus said, it's the Father in me that doeth the works. Mm -hmm. He said, my doctrine is not my own. If you've seen me, you've seen the Father. Why? Because it wasn't Jesus putting forth his own efforts, but it was what the Father was doing in him. That's why the Bible said the high priest, if he, if he perspired, he was not allowed to sweat. He wore his clothes in such a way that even though he was working very hard in performing his duties in the Old Testament, he was not allowed to perspire. The works of man will not bring you from visitation to habitation. But it's a sovereign thing that God is doing in the third day, and we are in the third day. We're in the third millennia from the resurrection of Jesus, and we're moving from revival visitation to glory habitation. habitation. Yes, let's have that. Mm -hmm. I feel him. <laughs> <laughs> and what does that mean? What does that mean for... I went to a great church meeting one time, and it was one of the best church meetings, I mean, that I'd ever been in. It was wonderful. God was showing up. Healings were taking place. Supernatural things were manifesting. And I was just grieved in my spirit. It's like the Spirit of God was on me. And it was like I could tell he was grieved. I said, God, what is your problem? <laughs> this is a perfectly good church meeting. He said, here's my problem. They want to experience this glory as an occasional visitation, and I want it to be an abiding testimony in their lives. Mama. I want them to walk around with this glory on the inside of them. 
but they only want to come here and visit every once in a while. My goodness. And, you know, I, I walked out of that circumstance and into a time of my life where I didn't see a lot of revival going on around me. But I had a habitation of God in my soul mm -hmm. that the Cane Ridge revival couldn't hold a candle to. Mm -hmm. The latter rain outpouring, the healing revivals, all of the things that we've heard, great revivals under people like Maria Woodworth Etter, Charles uh, Finney, D.L. Moody, uh, uh, A. A. Allen, William Branham. Uh, let me tell you something, folks. I don't have to look back to that. I've got that as a testimony, as a pillar of fire in my soul. And it, yeah. I could look out and maybe see nothing but religious death all around me, but I'm full of the life of God because I haven't limited myself mm -hmm. to visitation. I'm walking in habitation, and you can too. Glory to God. Whew. Yeah, it's all over you. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> so read verses 15. 14, did we do 14 yet? 14, 15, and 16. Okay. And Moses went down from the mount unto the people, and sanctified the people, and they washed their clothes. And he said unto the people, Be ready against the third day. Called out by something. <laughs> Come not at your wives. And it came to pass on the third day in the morning that there were thunders and lightnings and thick clouds upon the mount, and the voice of the trumpet exceeding loud, so that all the people that was in the camp trembled. <coughs> Oh, yeah, when God you know, shows up, there's trembling. And that's the same. They say, well, that was in the Old Testament. Well, in Revelations 4 1, John the Revelator was in the Spirit. He was in his habitation on the, on the day of the Lord, and he heard a voice, as it were, a trumpet speaking to him. What is the trumpet? The, the feast of the Lord, there is Passover, Jesus is our salvation. There is Pentecost, he is our baptizer in the Holy Ghost. But then there's the Feast of Tabernacles that begins with the Feast of Trumpets. And the trumpet is the prophetic. Uh, someone wrote a book uh, called Set the Trumpet to Thy Mouth. The trumpets were declared for celebration and warning. Warning to the enemies of God, you're about to be destroyed. Um, celebration to the people of God, we're entering into our habitation. We call that the Feast of Tabernacles. We're going to we're gonna come into a place of habitation, abiding testimony with the Spirit of God. You're not going to have to look back to some great move of God. You're not going to have to say, when is revival going to come? You're going to be walking around with the with the dunamis of, the, of what revival was in visitation will become an abiding testimony on the inside of you, and that will be the induction of the baptism of fire that will come into your life, and the, that with the culmination of which will be the adjudication of the saints, body felt salvation, um, the, uh, putting on immortality, the redemption of the purchased possession, or uh, if you have a timid approach to that, the rapture. Mm -hmm. Oh, and we'll talk about that one of these days. Help us, God. Uh, <laughs> but when it was, it was on the morning of the third day. We're in the morning of the third day, folks. Amen. <laughs> Sanctify yourself. We're uh, what else? It's 2014. We're in uh, when you, you adjust for a three-year era in the Gregorian calendar. We are in the 12th God's number of government. We're in the 12th year of the third day uh, since the resurrection of Jesus. Are you ready for some habitation? Amen. <laughs> Will you exchange visitation for I can habitation? Hear the people shouting on the other side of this broadcast. We're going to have to reorient. See, we're we've 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 structured Christian culture to accommodate visitation. We go visit him on a schedule, Sunday morning, Sunday night, you know, and if you're a real good Christian, you have to be there on Wednesday night too. It's a prayer meeting, but we don't pray. Uh, you have to be there. No, it's abiding visitation, and God's raising up a leadership who will accommodate, mentor, and lead a people of habitation uh, as opposed to a leadership, a kleros, a sacred priest class is leading a people of visitation. The, the current wine scan does not fit what God is doing. Preach it, brother. That's good preaching. Yeah. Read verses well, 17 glory. and 18. <laughs> I wish y'all were here. I hope you can feel the anointing on that. Uh, 17. And Moses brought forth the people out of the camp to meet with God, and they stood at the nether part of the mount. And Mount Sinai was altogether 
a smoke, because the Lord descended upon it in fire, and the smoke thereof ascended as the smoke of a furnace, and the whole mount quaked greatly. So notice Moses didn't exclude the people. He was an inclusive leader. He wanted the people to experience what he was seeing and experiencing. Listen to me. In a, in a, in a habitation economy of God, the leaders will not the leaders will be inclusive and transparent, not exclusive, sectarian and secretive. Amen. It reminds me of a word you got one time from Walter, one of our mentors. And he said, Russ, I see you in a crowd of people and you don't even open your mouth to speak. You just manifest yourself. And it's the manifest presence of God. The glory of God does all the work anyway when his habitation is so full that it oozes out of you and you don't need to speak. That's a day of habitation. Let's have that. And Mount Sinai, I'll read the next verse, was all together on a smoke. It's holy smoke. Not like they're doing in Colorado. Uh, Because the Lord descended upon it in fire. And the smoke thereof ascended as the smoke of a furnace, and the whole mountain quaked greatly. In the Old Testament, they had fire on the mountain. In the New Covenant, we have the fire of God within ourselves. Colossians 1.27 God wants more than visitation. He wants constantly abiding. In Christian culture, we call the church building the house of God. But in the new covenant reality, we are the habitation of God in ourselves. We are the house of God, according to Ephesians 2.22, in whom you are building together for a habitation of God through the Spirit. really bugs me. The Lord told me one time, he said, if you want to identify the idols in your culture, look at all the buildings you go into where you're expected to whisper. Banks, hospitals, churches, and libraries. Uh, We need to rethink some of our thinking with all these buildings. I don't believe Jesus died to put a building with a phallic symbol called a steeple on it on every street corner. He died to be something uh, in you as an abiding habitation, not in the midst of you as an occasional visitation. Do you get it? Do you get it? I I, I believe there are people that are going to listen that are going to get it. If you get it, send me an email. RussellWalden at (laughs) gmail.com. Go ahead and read through verse 21. And when the voice of the trumpet sounded long and waxed louder and louder, Moses spake, and God answered him by a voice. And the Lord came down upon Mount Sinai on the top of the mount, and the Lord called Moses up to the top of the mount, and Moses went up. And the Lord said unto Moses, Go down, charge the people, lest they break through unto the Lord, and gaze, and many of them perish. So he hadn't sent Jesus yet. In the Old Covenant, God maintained his distance. And he made it clear that approach to his presence was not possible without preparation. Mm-hmm. But in the New Covenant, 2 Corinthians 3.14, it says, which Remember the veil of the temple between the holy place and the holy of holies. The veil, 2 Corinthians 3.14 says, The veil which is done away in Christ. Mm-hmm. When Jesus died... That veil, which is some say it was three feet thick, was rent from the top to the bottom, signifying that the way into the Holy of Holies was made clear for you and I. And now the Ark of the Covenant is your human spirit. It's not some building somewhere. It's not some some tabernacle like we have in the in the uh, Catholic Church. It's uh, you are the house of God. You are the, your spirit is the sacred sacrament of who Jesus is and what Jesus is in your, your life. He wants to bring you from a culture of visitation to the substance of habitation, having an abiding testimony, the pillar of fire by night, the cloud by day. There are going to be signs, wonders, miracles, visitations, unusual things that are going to offend the mind and offend the, 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 those that are, are religious in their thinking and never believed in the first place. Uh, it, God's going to choose the foolish things of the world. We're going to see again the days of signs, miracles, and wonders be poured out upon the earth. 
And you will be the handmaid. And you will be uh, the servant, the bond servants of God that will be the arbiters of those manifestations, says the Father. Because I'm not going to leave you out and I'm not willing to do this that I'm doing without you, without uh, tabernacling myself within you because I'm a jealous God and I will not be excluded and I will not be contained, says the Father. Thank you, Father. And you get the opportunity to have a part. Thank you, Father. I'm raising up a habitational leadership, says the Father, that will tear down the cult of celebrity. And the cult of celebrity on the mountain of religion, in the mountain of media, will come and bow the knee and say, Jesus Christ is Lord, as they, uh, uh, as they survey the habitational glory of God in a meek, unobtrusive, uh, unimpressive in the natural leadership that they will witness the glory out of common man for whom I died, says the Father. Yes, Lord. We say yes. We say yes. Lord. Yes, Lord. So be it, Father. Have you read the rest of the chapter? I can see through blurry eyes. And the um, and let the priests also which come near to the Lord sanctify themselves, lest the Lord break forth upon them. And Moses said unto the Lord, The people cannot come up to Mount Sinai, for thou chargest us, saying, Set bounds upon the mount, and sanctify it. And the Lord said unto him, Away, get thee down, and thou shalt come up, thou and Aaron with thee. But let not the priest and the people break through to come up to the Lord, lest he break forth upon them. So Moses went down unto the people and spake unto them. It was a new day for the nation of God, and it's a, a new day for you and I. Yes, Lord. We're moving into the, the, the infrastructure of habitational glory is being raised up. In our midst. We're in a cultural wilderness. But God is establishing. A habitation. Of glory. In the midst of this cultural wilderness. That we see in the world today. And he's calling forth a people. And they're going to be led by the prophetic. They won't exclude the other ministries. But, but where the pastors would not go. And where the apostles would not go. And where the teachers and the evangelists would not go. God is raising up a relevant prophetic generation. That will pierce the veil of religious acceptability. And the norms of religion. And are going to walk in the glory. That others will gain the benefit of in following after. But he's calling forth a people. Who are going to stand upright and begin to move into that place and find themselves uh, standing in that column of, of the glory of God that he chooses to be in us. Not in occasional visitation, but in continual habitation. And, you, and people will look at you and they'll see like Moses, your face will shine with the glory of of God upon your life and millions will be brought into the kingdom because of the testimony that I will establish you to be in the earth says the father praise you father praise you father been an unusual and unique time oh completely unanticipated I, I saw these things I always prepare ahead of time to make notes special time that we've had with the Lord today uh, we bless you. We look forward to coming back to you tomorrow. Thank you.